So if you've followed my channel for a little while, you know that I am starting on a journey to rebuild my home network from the ground up to be optimally designed, well documented, and as efficient as possible. And as part of that, I want to learn a lot more about IPv6. I know that IPv6 is something that's very important to implement for the future of the internet, and I wanted to do my part to make sure all of my internal services are working properly on IPv6, so I don't have to manage dual stack in the future. I can just deal with IPv6. So, as a test of myself and as a test of transition technologies, I am going to spend a week without IPv4 at all. B big asterisk there, that at all, but I'm gonna do it. So, for the next week, my phone, my laptop, are gonna be connected to their own Wi-Fi network. That network has access to everything However, it has no IP version 4 connectivity at all. My phone and my laptop will get IP version 6 addresses, publicly routable as is usual. They can connect to any of my internal servers via IPv6 through the router as they always would. They can connect out to the internet as they always would. What they can't do is connect out to an IPv4 address directly. Now you might say, but what about all those websites that don't support IPv6? Well, I could just ignore half of the internet, roughly half. I guess still do YouTube, so I guess uh, I guess that's safe. But um, I don't want to live entirely without IPv4. I just don't want to have to deal with IPv4 on my own network. So come along with me on this adventure. Hopefully it's fun. I guess it could be really bad, but hopefully it's fun. So in a simplified way, this is how a normal network would look with dual stack. So out on the internet, we have IPv4 and we have IPv6. And the poor folks that manage routing have to route both of them because we can't transition. Then we get to our firewall, which in my case is OpenSense. On the IPv6 side, it's pretty simple. We pass stuff right on through. We do routing and firewalling, and that's uh, the usual firewall router stuff. On the IPv4 side, we have to do a little bit more. We also have to do NAT, which we very much love to hate because it causes so many problems for us. So we like to get rid of that, and on IPv6, we did. But on IPv4, we have to do routing and firewalling and NAT. So all three of those things have to happen to the packet. So imagine if we could just get rid of this whole line here and get rid of that there and get rid of that. And now we just have to deal with one set of everything. The firewall rules, the routing tables, no more NAT because NAT's gone. Wouldn't that be great? So what I'm testing is something similar to this. What I would eventually like is to basically have a little gateway over here. So get rid of my local IPv4 addresses, get rid of my local IPv4 connectivity, and just have my IPv6 traffic. Have a little NAT guy that sits here, and when traffic has an IPv6 address that's carefully crafted so that we know that it should be translated IPv4, we translate to IPv4. The well-known prefix for that is 64FF9B colon colon slash 96. So what that means is we take the IPv4 address, which is 32 bits long, and we stick it on the end of this 96-bit prefix to make a 128-bit IPv6 address. And then the IPv6 routers can treat this as an IPv6 packet. They can route it. They can do all that good stuff. And eventually it'll end up with this NAT here. And this NAT now has to go NAT64 instead of NAT44 because it's taking an IPv6 packet translating it into an IPv4 packet with an IPv4 destination, and the source address ends up being whatever our public internet address is. And finally, DNS. So in order for all this to work, we need our clients to think they're entirely talking IPv6, which means all the names they get via DNS need to get translated from A records into quad A records. And I'm doing that on the OpenSense side in Unbound. There is an option here you check that says Enable DNS64 Support. And basically what happens is if a client requests a quad A record and no quad A record is present, it will try to request an A record instead. And if it gets an A record, it'll synthesize a quad A record using the 64FF9B prefix. So hi guys, 24 hour update. It has been one full day since I switched my laptop and my phone to be all IPv6. What have I found so far? So far the phone has worked flawlessly. I have had no issues at all on my phone with the stuff I do every day. I have no idea if the phone is falling back onto cellular connectivity sometimes. 
all the apps I use work perfectly fine. It's been great. The laptop has not been quite as smooth. The biggest issue I found has been in voice and video chat, especially from the web. So this is probably the issue of IPv4 literals. So as you know, I don't have IPv4 connectivity, just IPv6. So if the service has native IPv6 or via DNS, smooth sailing, everything's great. If the service doesn't have IPv6, then the DNS names of their servers get translated to IPv6, sent to the NAT, and that gets translated back to IPv4 at the edge of my network. That works great too. I can browse websites, watch videos and stuff from websites that don't support IPv6. It works fine. The one problem is when the website embeds direct IP addresses. So this happened to me with Discord. Discord works perfectly fine for just typing chat. When you go to open a voice or video chat, it will get stuck at connecting. And if you look at the little thing, it says like allocated server, but can't connect to it. So what happens then is to do a voice or video chat, Discord is allocating some relay server on their end to manage your chat. And it's passing your client the IP address of that server. So because it's an IPv4 address, it's not getting translated by DNS like it would normally, and it can't reach out to that server, it just can't connect. Other than that, I can say web browsing for the last few days has been great. And if I look at my stats now, and I'm sure they'll be up on your screen, I have so far done 1.2 gigs of traffic on IPv6, 500 megs on IPv4. So day two update, how has my day gone without IPv4? Today I looked into why my phone works so much better than my laptop. And this really did shock me. My phone figured out that it's on an IPv6 only network and automatically enabled 464xLAT for itself. So 464xLAT is a technology that I was not planning on enabling for this test. Basically, the end device self-assigns itself an IPv4 address and the operating system tunnels IPv4 packets to my IPv6 NAT64 prefix on its own. So devices still think they have an IPv4 address, they can send packets from it, and the operating system will transit them to IPv6 and send them off. This is done really widely on mobile networks. So T-Mobile in the US, I think was the first one to implement it here. Um, and my phone automatically figured out it was on a network that had NAT64 support, and enabled NAT64 with 464xLAT, which is brilliant. So I started looking and I'm like, well, maybe can my MacBook do this too? You know, I got Apple laptop. Why can't it do 464xLAT? And I found some posts from macOS Monterey, which is version 12, that stated that it was able to listen to the DHCP v4 um, response that told it to go look for IPv6, but it wasn't looking at anything else. And I thought, since those posts were almost a year old now, maybe if I update to the latest version, Mac OS 13, Ventura, that it would work. And so I did that, and sure enough, it worked. My, um, the way you can tell it works is because it shows up as you having an IPv4 address that's 192.0.0. something. So my phone picked 192.0.0.1, my laptop picked .2, and it, it'll have a slash 32 prefix with no default route. And basically, when you go to an IP address in a web browser, it will automatically translate that at the OS level to IPv6, and it's great. So again, I'll show a graph of the traffic from the past day. Um, there's a small spike in the upload direction, and that was actually me saving a video file from my phone to my storage server, which has a different subnet. So it traversed the IPv6 gateway, but it wasn't actually uh, going out to the internet. There's a massive download spike where I downloaded macOS Ventura, and installed it, and that worked perfectly fine. There were no issues doing that over IPv6. Apple seems to have their IPv6 stuff together, which is great. So now that I've learned that clients are automatically enabling 464xLAT, which is really cool, tomorrow I'm gonna try Windows 10, Windows 11, and I'm gonna see if I can get an Android device. I don't have any new Android phones. I've been Mac only for quite a while, but um, I'll see what I can do. So be back to you tomorrow with tomorrow's update. Day three update here for you. So last night after I filmed the day two update, I spent some time doing voice and video chatting on Discord. And it seems like with Mac OS Ventura, enabling the CLAT or the client side translator has fixed all the problems. So Mac OS is now translating all of my traffic to IPv6 for me, magically. It's a beautiful thing. And everything just works wonderfully on Mac at least. So today I tried to venture out into some other operating systems. First, I tried hooking my workstation up to my IPv6 network just for a little bit because I actually do have to get work done and I don't want to mess with that. 
and everything worked about as I'd expect. So NAT64 and DNS64 were working fine. Websites generally work, but some minor issues, um, nothing too big. Another cool thing I found is that Windows file sharing works just fine over IPv6 as long as you put everything in DNS. But there's no way to type IPv6 literals into Windows because Windows is Windows made some big mistakes in how they handle file paths. And the rest of the world didn't. You can put the IPv6 address in square brackets. Everything is just fine. Windows freaks out. So you have to put your server names in DNS. You can't just type the addresses in. But really, you shouldn't be typing the addresses anyway. So then I tried a couple other operating systems in virtual machines. So all of these were running in virtual machines connected to my IPv6 network. I did Windows 11, and man, was it tough to get it to install without creating a cloud account. But I, Microsoft Edge works fine uh, in Windows 11. Everything worked as I expected. It didn't do uh, 464xlet automatically, and apparently there's no real way to enable it in Windows. It'll only do it on mobile interfaces, which is kind of irritating because the code's obviously there. It just won't enable it. Then I tried Ubuntu Desktop, um, Jammy Jellyfish. I just ran a live CD on a virtual machine, and that ran perfectly fine. Again, it didn't automatically enable 464xlat, but it got all the routing correctly. Everything else worked fine. So it is Windows and Mac and iOS. Uh, I'm going to try to borrow an Android phone tomorrow. I don't have any Android phones to test with, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so tomorrow we're probably going to have a bit of an Android focus. Today was more Windows and Linux, as I've been doing Mac the whole time. So that's basically my update for today. So today is day four. I managed to borrow an old Motorola phone that someone had left over. I'm not sure exactly what phone it is, but it runs Android 10. So it doesn't have anything installed because it was factory reset. So I made sure it did updates and I just installed Firefox and that was it. I had some issues that I initially blamed on Chrome, but I think it could have been DNSSEC related. Also, I'm pretty sure it was trying to go out to Google's DNS servers. That was giving it bad IP address. Well, it was giving it good IP addresses, but good IP addresses that weren't translated by DNS64. So I had to turn off secure DNS. It didn't just work. It didn't work. So that's something to be aware of, I guess, with Android devices, especially older ones. Um, I'm guessing blocking the usual Google DNS addresses would fix this because it wouldn't be able to get Google DNS and it would use the network provided one automatically. But uh, yeah, so that's what I found with Android. Um, in general, it works about as well as like Windows or other things once I figured out the prefix was the issue. Day five of the challenge, and I really don't have much to report today. In the meantime, the uh, thin clients are getting set up for their all IPv6 networking video, which I'm going to work on now that I finished the two and a half gig project. So these guys are going to get some two and a half gig networking, and we're going to test IPv6 clusters and SAF and all that good stuff. So stay tuned for that. Day six here, and I've been coming across an issue intermittently that I've been trying to debug before I talk to you guys about. And it seems to be a bug in the firmware of some of my Wi-Fi access points, because it only happens when I'm in the basement, which is really weird. Um, what seems to be happening is that my laptop is getting IP addresses in IPv6 on both my normal home subnet, which is the untagged VLAN, as well as my private subnet for this test, which is VLAN 9. Uh, I don't get a link local on that, so I don't, it's not seeing it as two networks. And I can't actually communicate on the network, so it actually kind of breaks a lot of things because my client tries to go out to the wrong subnet, but I can't actually talk to it. It just gets router advertisements from it. So my guess is that um, there's some bug in the IPv6 multicast handling, which is why traffic doesn't get through, but multicast does. Because when I come upstairs where I have newer access points, it goes away. And I don't have the problem again, <laughs> which is really bizarre. So I guess these are the kind of issues I expect to see a lot, or that like firmware and older devices doesn't properly handle IPv6 or things like that. So yeah, that's my update for day six. So last night the challenge finished and I didn't make a video about it. So here I am today, here are my conclusions. So first off, what went well? Well, YouTube and a lot of major websites do work on IPv6 just fine. A couple major websites don't. The one that I particularly used to test was Reddit, which has an interesting case where reddit.com has a IPv6 address, a quad A, but it redirects you to a CDN at fastly.net, which does not support IPv6, which is odd. So at least for the global internet, IPv6 only seems to be 
not quite there yet, but we're getting there. So what about DNS64 and NAT64? How did those work? So on the DNS side, DNS64 worked flawlessly, OpenSense did it in Unbound, that was great. The one downside to doing Unbound is the static leases I had of IPv4 addresses weren't translated. So I'd like to see a DNS resolver that does DNS64 after, so any static leases to internal services get um, DNS 64 ified on their own. I could do it manually, it was just nice to have that automatically. NAT 64. The one regret I had was I ran my NAT 64 server on this little server here, and I couldn't do any other testing on my box computer for the whole week. So I should have put it in a better place. I have looked at Taiga, which is an open source software that does user space NAT 64. Um, OpenBSD has NAT64 in their version of PF, but FreeBSD does not, so OpenSense probably won't support it for quite some time. On the Linux side, we have Joule, which works fantastic, but obviously I use OpenSense, so that's not quite the best solution for me, but it's probably the solution I'll keep running with for now. And lastly, what about 464xlat? So my Apple devices all did 464xlat automatically, which was awesome. I did not expect that to work so well. For the rest of my devices, they generally worked perfectly fine under DNS64. So do you need IPv6 for clients in 2023? Not really. As long as they can get to the IPv4 internet via NAT64 and DNS64, they're pretty much just fine. There were very few cases I had where that was not working, and the biggest case was peer-to-peer -peer or um, like video voice over IP protocols that were doing direct um, IPv4 literals. So Discord, for example, the chat works fine, even though it's an IPv4 only app, but as soon as it went to allocate a call, it wouldn't work because their protocol was embedding IPv4 literal addresses instead of DNS names. So that was a bit unfortunate, but um, I don't know. My laptop did 464x live that got over that. In reality, I don't think I'm gonna implement IPv6 only going forward, but I'm gonna do IPv6 dual stack again, like I used to do. And this time I'm going to do IPv6 primary instead of IPv4 primary. So I'm going to prefer IPv6 addresses for all of my internal services, unless they absolutely can't deal without it. I'm going to put effort into making IPv6 on all of my internal services by DNS. So that's where I go from here. And uh, hopefully you guys stick along for the ride as I try to build out a well thought out IPv6 home network and kind of redesign everything based on what I've learned in the last couple years doing networking and things like that. And uh, yeah, as always, I have a Discord server down below. You'll feel free to chat with me there. And uh, I'll see you in the next adventure. Oh, by the way, the, uh, the cluster is getting reformatted again for more Ceph videos again. And uh, that's what I'm doing now. Come along for that.